Okay, yeah, 13, this is a video for this week's work and it centres around aerobic training and the adaptations that take place in the body as a result of aerobic training. As I've said, I'm not in lesson on Tuesday, but, um, but so this is ahead of Friday's lesson, but there is some other things for you to be getting on with which I'll talk to you about uh, towards the end of the video. So, really importantly, what you need to be aware of is that we are talking about uh, long-term elements here, all right? So just bear in mind, we've talked about this before, but short-term response or responses, long-term is adaptation. So if um, we're thinking about the short-term effects of exercise on the body, we're thinking about responses there, that would be increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, those kind of things. We're now thinking about long-term effects of exercise on the body, and in this instance, aerobic exercise. So these are adaptations, things that are going to happen and remain within our body, provided our training continues. And, and um, that's what we're going to discuss in, in detail during this video. This video, um, there's a couple of slides that contain an awful lot of information. Uh, there's not many slides to this. You're going to need to pause this, uh, look at things in detail, rewind stuff back because it shouldn't be too long but it does contain an awful lot of info um, so what is aerobic training it says here aerobic training is a zone not a type of training so it's really important that you're aware of that um, what you might be sort of traditionally thinking of is continuous training um, but so aerobic training is a zone is a zone we get to rather than a type of training and it's any training that occurs uh, with the aerobic system as the primary energy source and you can see this is a diagram from your textbook and uh, we've got a duration down this side here duration of exercise so if we've been exercising for 10 seconds we know because of our work on uh, ATP resynthesis that that we would be working there with the ATP system and we would be getting a high high percentage of our energy from uh, anaerobic sources without oxygen um, and you can see here we've got 6% coming from aerobic energy and 94% coming from anaerobic energy. To come down here, where we're looking at um, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, you can see how that those figures have changed over. And I've just uh, included this slide so that you can see that represented slightly differently. So rather than a time, we've actually got distances down the bottom here. So we've got distances in meters, we've got 500 meters, 1,000 meters, 1,500 meters, as you can see. And the blue line, is the percentage of our energy that's coming from aerobic sources and the red line is the percentage that is coming from anaerobic sources. So this is all very familiar to us, it's all stuff we know but it's useful for you to bear in mind when you think about um, the aerobic system. Uh, and if you think, how, why would someone uh, who's been performing that long or um, in, in a, an endurance event, why would they be getting any percentage of their energy from uh, anaerobic systems? Just got a short video clip that might uh, hopefully clarify things for you. What you're about to see is Mo Farah and the final lap of him in a 5,000 meter race. So bearing in mind he's been running for uh, around about 13 minutes, I think, when you see this. What I, want, I want you to watch uh, what Mo Farah does now with this last lap. So you can see that's him coming towards the, the last lap there now. For those of you that are not aware, that I can't believe that any of you wouldn't be, that gentleman there is Mo Farah, and if you didn't know that, I don't know whether you're on the right course. But just watch what happens now as he goes into the last lap. You can see straight away, there's no way that he would be able to generate that speed purely through using his aer aerobic system. You know, what he's producing there is absolutely being resynthesized through ATP. That's a nice shot of the crowd there. What I would say to you is Mo is running as that fast. He runs a 51 second final lap. So 51 seconds for 400 metres. Uh, I don't know whether there's any of us in our group that would be able to produce that. I apologise if I'm doing you a disservice but I don't think there's any of us that could do a 51 second uh, 400 metres after we've, ju we've just run uh, well, best part of 5,000 metres. So there you are. That's why there is still room for us to be producing some parts of our energy through anaerobic systems. Okay, there are two tables in the textbook on page 84. 82, there's one on 82, this one's on 82, this one's on 84, that are both useful to you, and they'll be useful to you in your coursework that you're doing with Mr. Shutt as well, because what you've got here is a representation of training intensity objectives up here, 
we'll talk about that in a second. And you've also got on this side, Borg's uh, rating of perceived exertion. And this is quite commonly used. If you go on to do sports science, you'll hear this term quite a lot. And what, it, what they both serve to do is to try and show how different it is uh, different things happen when you're performing at slightly different levels of exertion, how hard you're actually training. So this, this uh, table up here has training zone 1 to 6, and it gives that intensity as a percentage. Uh, you can see that, and it also will then give an ob objective for why you would train at the percentage. So if you're training below 60% intensity, that they would suggest that that was because you were looking to recover from an event, perhaps partly cool down or a longer period of time to uh, remove lactic acid, etc. Whereas over here, bulk scale runs from 6 to 20. Uh, that's how he set his scale out. And you'll see some of the different terminology that he uses um, to move all the way from no exertion at all to maximal exertion. Now these two tables are important because what we're going to do is initially talk about the adaptations we would see if we were uh, training at around 60 to 70 percent and you'll see there this cardiovascular benefits and localized muscular endurance um, and then we're also going to look at the benefits that you get from training at 70 to 80 percent as well so firstly if we look at 60 to 70 percent now i apologize this is really wordy you're just going to have to um pause this rewind it back you're going to have to make your notes you're going to have to do a bit of reading as well because uh, there's some quite tricky stuff here so you need to listen to what's been said and and process that some of these terms may be new to you some of them um hopefully won't be at all so the top two for example um, we're going to get an increase in stroke volume and an increase in cardiac output. Neither of those terms should be new to you, just in case though, stroke volume is the amount of blood that is ejected from the heart per beat, so per contraction, the amount of blood that uh, is ejected from the heart. Cardiac output is the same, but it's per minute, so what you would do is time stroke volume by heart rate, which gives us cardiac output, and you will sometimes see that referred to as Q. Um, we would also get an increased number of red blood cells. We are well aware that red blood cells are our um, means of carrying oxygen in the, in the blood, in the haemoglobin. So that is a, a benefit for endurance athletes. Cardiac hypertrophy, uh, you should have heard that term before, but that is basically an increase in the size and the volume of the heart. So any time when you're thinking about um, muscle and the heart being a muscle, hypertrophy uh, is the term for growth. So you can experience muscular hypertrophy in any of your muscles in your body, but you can also experience muscular atrophy, uh, which is where um, the, the size is reduced. So hypertrophy is you get bigger, so the heart is getting bigger, stronger, which is helping with these uh, two terms up here. Uh, we're not going to discuss in the video uh, increased systolic volume or diastolic volume, just because um, I think... It, I may confuse you slightly, and I'd rather that happen, those discussions happen in the classroom, but you can include that in your notes for now, and then we're going to really get into the details of that in the, in the classroom. Um, the number and the density of the mitochondria. Now, this is important. This is really important, because as we know from our work on energy systems, the mitochondria is where much of um, the muscle's ATP is resynthesized. It's the area of the, of the um, cell that... And then the muscle that the ATP is resynthesized. So when we, um, one of the long-term adaptations from aerobic exercise is that we get an increased density and an increased number of our mitochondria, and that means that we can resynthesize it, resynthesize sorry ATP much more quickly and more efficiently. Myoglobin, we should be aware that increased myoglobin um, means that we've got uh, more ability to absorb oxygen into the muscles the myoglobin is the element in the muscles that has a higher affinity for oxygen than um hemoglo hemoglobin does so it, it, it tracks the oxygen away from the hemoglobin this none of this should be new to you though um so just just so that we're aware make sure if that is new to you that you you know you get those notes down and you double check anything with me you're not happy with okay hyaline cartridge is something that covers the end of our bones to give the smooth a smooth surface for the joints basically so that it we don't get fi friction and it allows the smooth movement uh, it won't come as a surprise to you that this can lead to a decrease in body fat um, moving on as well uh, we get a reduction in resting heart rate which is why sometimes your resting heart rate is taken as a measure of a level of aerobic fitness or you know general well-being and we get an improved ability to use fat as an energy source. 
Now, before I move on to the next slide, um, you, what you need to be aware of is you need to know these things, but you also need to know how that would have a positive impact. So why an increase in stroke volume would be a positive thing. Why cardiac hypertrophy would have a positive impact on an endurance athlete. Yeah, um, And that's what we're going to really focus on in the, in the lesson as well. Um, if we think now about someone who's training at 70 to 95%, um, so they're obviously training in a, if you think back to this slide we're now looking at someone who's working in training zone 4 and 5 and right even up to number 6 as well what you're going to see is some, some similar things and again we'll come back to systolic volume and diastolic volume uh, in the lesson please but you'll also see that these things we had cardiac hypertrophy earlier but we're talking about an even greater increase in the size of the heart and the strength of the heart that we're being able to uh, to create. If you think about the increased strength of ventricular, uh, ventricular contractions and that ties into this systolic volume stuff that we're going to talk about in lesson but you need to think about um, the chambers of the heart, the ventricles in the heart and how an increased strength of that contraction, how that's going to tie into things like uh, stroke volume in particular. Uh, bradycardia might be a term that's new to you. Effectively bradycardia means that it's, uh, that's used to identify anyone whose resting heart rate is lower than 60 beats per minute, although you'll sometimes hear that uh, as quoted as more like 40 beats per minute, to be honest. Um, some uh, endurance athletes, I know at one point Lance Armstrong, who might not be the best example anymore, but Lance Armstrong, he had a resting heart rate of down near sort of sub 30 beats per minute. Uh, it's, again, used as a measure of... Um, the effectiveness, the effectiveness of the heart and uh, of endu endurance athletes, their le base level of fitness. We get an increase in VO2 max, which um, Mr. Schutt's going to be talking to you about when you go down to the university as well. But VO2 max, as we've discussed in lesson, is basically our ability to utilise the oxygen that comes into the body. So our maximal oxygen uptake, basically the greatest, uh, the greatest volume of oxygen that can be used per minute in the uh, in the body and then we also get an increased tolerance and ability to utilize and transport lactic acid so think about our ability to utilize lactic acid what do we use it for what can we use it for how can we convert it what do we convert it to but then also our tolerance um, why is that going to be important what's that going to prevent key questions for you to ask yourself there right that concludes what I'm going to give you content wise what I want you to do is I want you to also, um, because I'm not in lesson, you've got this extra bit of time, I want you to start working on a little bit of a project that we're going to work on, or you're going to work on as a group. And it basically looks from page 88 in the textbook right through to page 97, because that is all stuff that you will have covered as far back as GCSE. You'll have covered it with Mr. Shutt as well. Um, but basically, you are going to present that as a group you're responsible for if it's a video, if it's a presentation, if it's a booklet, whatever you decide to do to showcase your knowledge on this, you basically are going to produce uh, the information that we as a group use on that. And it's entirely up to you guys how, you, how you're going to do it. One thing I would say is you have to explain what it is, obviously, but you also have to explain who would use it, as in what type of athlete would use it, and what benefits it would bring for a specific sports performance. So which type, which method of training applies to what groups of athletes, types of athletes, and what benefits would you be looking to, would be, they be looking, sorry, to get from it. Um, I hope it makes sense, the video. Uh, I apologise that it's a little bit wordy in a couple of places. Uh, I fully expect that there's going to be lots of questions to be asked about this, and like I say, in the lesson, when we get to lesson time, we'll be applying the knowledge that I've given you, so you, you can you can memorise and know now what those adaptations are, what we need to start doing is applying that, why that's a benefit. Okay, thanks very much.